You know, we're the only country in the world where the pursuit of happiness is guaranteed in writing. You believe that? Hmm? Bunch of fucking spoiled brats. Where's my happiness then? It's the pursuit that's guaranteed. Yeah, always a fucking loophole, right? There's a psychological condition known as elixithymia, common in certain personalities. The individual craves almost ceaseless action, which enables them to avoid acknowledging the abhorrent things they do. Abhorrent? What certain personalities? Antisocial personalities. I really love that clip from The Sopranos because it alludes to the existential quandary that we find ourselves in in our modern industrialized world. Where and to what extent, to what dosage and amount and limit do we satiate our pleasures? And we can further explore this idea by looking at the psychology of addiction and chemical changes in our brains when we watch pornography or engage in drug or alcohol usage. But neuropsychology aside, to what ends do we reach in always striving for pleasure? Perhaps we get pleasure from drugs because they stimulate the same brain areas as sex and food. And I just want to touch on financial wealth and well-being here because it's a very important part of our modern hustle and bustle culture. Uh, the financial stability is found recurrently to be a major component of well-being. Having a median of around $75,000 yearly, at least in the United States, is the baseline for a certain amount of financial well-being needed for materialistic stability. Upwards of that, in most economic science journals, we see very little fluctuation of well-being or happiness. This is called the livability theory or the idea that income only enhances well-being below or past basic human needs. This means that there is a non-significant difference between a person who has one Bentley and a person who has two Bentleys, all things considered, right? Someone making $150,000 a year versus someone making $300,000 a year. My son. You're just like I am. Can't figure your life out. Can't put the pieces together. Just like A pilgrim on this earth. A stranger. Fragments. Pieces. Of a man. Where did I go wrong? Wealth can be adaptive or maladaptive, as I outlined previously in this lecture right here at the uh, School Psychology Conference in Baltimore. We readily adapt to materialistic affordances, something called the hedonic treadmill. And we illustrate that right here. We can picture a hamster running on a wheel and substitute our own wily desires and ideas for that new car or house or phone or person which will be the surefire antidote to our ills and worries. Like the hamster, we only continue running on that same treadmill because our neurophysiology and psychology adapt 
right? After we buy that phone, even after we fall in love with a person who's so beautiful and novel in our life, right? Usually after a couple of months, we adapt and we usually fluctuate back to our baseline level of happiness, right? And there's a lot of research that I'm putting below on the hedonic treadmill, um, the hedonic treadmill. And I also used the example of Hurley before from the show Lost, right? Someone who wins the lottery. And you think for most people in life, that would be like, if only I won the lottery, I would be so happy in life, right? But that show does a great job of twisting it on its head, right? That it brings about like an untold amount of problems, right? As Biggie, Biggie Small said it, right? More money, more problems, right? Bad luck. Hugo, you are not the first lottery winner to believe the money's brought him nothing but trouble. It's all in your head. What, you don't believe in jinxes? You know, curses? I'm an accountant. I believe in numbers. Dude, don't look at me like that. I'm not crazy. This is real. Come on, Hugo, listen to yourself. The numbers are cursed. You know there is no such thing as a... <laughs> Um, and I'm also using uh, this clip from The Matrix here, right? Because another philosophical rebuttal against this idea of pure egotistical hedonism is uh, a philosopher by the name of Nozick who gave this scenario. If you could be in a simulation where you can just receive the maximum amount of pleasure in your life, would you choose to leave, right? So that kind of gives us a red pill versus blue pill scenario, right? And there's actually a character in The Matrix, right? Jo played by Joey Pants from The Sopranos also, who plays, uh, plays Ralphie, who is outside of The Matrix, right? He knows that it's all a game, right? Kind of like the figure in the Plato's cave, right? He's seen that the world is a simulation, but he'd rather still choose to live in that world, right? Because it's better than living in this post-industrial apocalypse as, as they do. Do we have a deal, Mr. Reagan? You know, I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what I realize? <sighs> Ignorance is bliss. And now just to bring in some neurobiology, some neuropsychology here, hedonistic processes which consist of brain patterns in the hind and midbrain allow us to make quick judgments about what may be momentarily advantageous or harmful to us. Hence, evolutionary speaking, what is, pleasurable, what is pleasurable for us seeks an important function in helping accumulate psychological fuel, avoid pleasure, get rest, get, eat well. Uh, Steger and Shin summarize this with a metaphor of hot and cold systems, two distinct operations of how our brains function. Hedonic biological underpinnings, which is the hot system, being more focused on narrow concerns in a more affective and visceral manner, which signify to the amygdala what is good for us and what is bad or undesirable. For example, if you are walking home and a large dog begins chasing you, your automatic response would be to fight or flight. The same underlying processes which make up our pleasure-seeking behaviors But Michelle came to think of self-restraint as a muscle that can be developed. And the best way to flex that muscle is by cooling desires when temptation strikes. That is, reframing an urge or diverting your attention. You have leaves on the back, you have a trunk in the middle. It's enticing to think of self-control as an admirable act of brute willpower, but it's a failing strategy. Your best bet is turning something that tempts into something else entirely. 